Good morning. So, I'm Hannes. Um, and indeed, tonight I will be using a guitar that I built myself to play on stage at the after party. So if you're a guitar geek, like, come find me today. Um, I love talking about that stuff. But that's not what this talk is about. Um, today I want to talk about Lego and marbles. And I have a couple of disclaimers before we dive in. Like, first disclaimer, I'm not saying that Lego is better than marbles or the other way around. I know that I pissed off some Lego people with the title of my talk. Um, I mean, in my, my household, you can find both, right? Um, also, that Lego set is the Lego set that I dreamt of as a kid. I never got it. It was the control center. It w is what evolved into what now is called Mindstorms, which Lego unfortunately discontinued recently, but not before I got the last edition. So that's good. Um, no, what I'm saying is I think collaboration is better than coexistence. And by hazard, when I first gave this talk, the week before I gave this talk, my kids built this. So they use Duplo, which is a Lego product, to build supports for their mar marble tracks, right? Um, so I'm not all about dissing Lego at all. Also, this talk is not going to be about any hipster frameworks or fancy libraries. Um, none of that is going to be here today. So if you chose the wrong talk, that's OK. You can walk out and go to uh, Adam Tornhill's upstairs, which is going to be amazing. I saw that talk. Um, it's good. And I know who is also amazing. So it only gets awkward if we're left to like five more people and, and then the last two leave. That, that gets awkward, right? Um, but feel free. And then a public service announcement. There is no such thing as Legos, right? Um, Lego is a brand name. It's used as an adjective. So you say Lego set, Lego brick. You never say Legos, right? Don't do that. It triggers Lego people, right? <laughs> Don't do that. So that was the um, disclaimers out of the way. So let's dive into what we were building um, when I built the code that led up to this talk. So I was working for an IoT company. Um, and you have to see that mostly as an I IoT systems integrator. So what we built was a platform that talked to our proprietary gateways, which were IoT devices. And those IoT devices, they could put bricks in. Bricks were not Lego bricks. Um, bricks was the, the, the term that we used for a small circuit board that could plug into the main board, and it was basically a USB connection underneath. So we could communicate to all different kinds of IoT, uh, devices that were not necessarily IoT enabled before we started with them, but we would make them IoT enabled. That's what we did. And it was all one big deployment. So we had our backend that was one multi-tenant system, and we had all of our gateways into the fields, and depending on what bricks, they could talk to the devices that were in that building, right? Going from smart plugs, window blinds, um, thermostats, like you name it, we could talk to it. Um, and a typical day of work for us was doing like implementations of a new type of devices. So we were talking with um, device manufacturers a lot of the time, uh, but also to people who wanted to use our platform to make their devices smart, right? Um, and we had a lot of different types of devices that we could talk to, and all of that had to make its way into the code base that we used in the backend. Now, this happened all the time. So what we did as a team is we, had, we were implementing these new devices all of the time, and some of those projects went live, and others, well, not so much. Um, and our product management team didn't like it if we removed the code from a device that didn't go live, because we might do a similar device in the future. Ever, anybody heard those arguments before, right? We might do something similar in the future. We invested money in this code, like all those fallacies, right? Um, so yeah, we were in some kind of maintenance hell. Um, and this maintenance hell was making our life hard because we had all these this tightly coupled code that, that for all these different device types and, and some of them were live and some of them were not. And, um, so yeah, no, not so great. Um, so what I wanted to do 
my sons like which two, which one of these you need. Uh, they both have different favorite colors. They both love Lego, so they would choose a different one. What they do agree on is that you need one of these, right? And if you go to Ken Thompson's quote on removing code, um, he said, like, one of my most productive day, days was the day that I removed a thousand line of, lines of code. And that is how we as a team felt. It's like, if we want to keep maintaining this system, we're going to need to start throwing away code, or at least making sure that it doesn't hinder us, right? And we were talking to product management, and product management, um, well, as you might have expected, was not really planning to change their ways. I mean, this was the business that they were running. They were still very much in the startup mentality still. They maybe were in the startup, but, um, but they assured us that new devices would keep coming and they expected us to be able to reuse code that we had already written. So we figured like, okay, on that side, we're not gonna get what we want. So we have to solve this problem internally with our development team in a way that we can no longer suffer from all this, uh, the way that things were. So what we wanted is we wanted to be able to very quickly implement these new device types, especially in that prototyping phase when we were talking to a manufacturer. It's like, hey, you have this device. Let, let us prove to you that it can work with our platform and what we can offer you. But we also wanted to be able to really quickly remove it again um, if it never went anywhere. Um, so we wanted to limit the dependencies between devices and we wanted to make like really clear abstractions for the devices that we did. So we wanted to stop polluting our code base with all these implementations that happened all the time. Because we, know, we knew statistically that only 30% of, of these are gonna make it into production. Um, so it didn't make sense to have all of that polluting the main court, uh, code base. So you're probably thinking, I, like, yeah, Hannes, you should be doing microservices, right? Microservices. So let me park that question for a second and let me tell you a little bit about um, what I've seen because I coach a lot of developers. And there is this path that I've seen. I coach .NET developers. So most of these are like object-oriented third-generation programmers. Um, and they all go through a similar path. So they start with what we could call a big ball of mud or, or whatever you call it. It's like you stitch code together that you find online and you find out really quickly that it's gonna be hard to maintain if you tightly couple everything. And hopefully you go through this in college or before somebody starts paying you to write software, uh, but not everybody has that luxury. So at some point you run into the wall when you evolve a system that is tightly coupled and everything goes together. And when you build your next system, you go like, okay, I, I need to make better choices and, and separate my code. So you probably start doing something like layers, right? We have a database at the bottom and a UI at the top and all of the layers, they consume the layer below it, right? You don't do that with cake. You eat all the layers at once because that's delicious. Um, but you, cons like, you consume the layer below you and, and, and you offer a contract to the layer above you, right? And you have a business logic and the data access, all of that. You start doing that and then you find out that if you want to make a change, you have to go through all of the layers. It's still all pretty tightly coupled. Bonus points if you do deploy them separately, at least you get some flexibility then. But you feel like, nah, it needs to be better. And somebody might tell you about something like solid. And it's like, okay, yes, solid. Those are good principles for a flexible code base. And then I've seen code bases that are abstractions over abstractions over abstractions over abstractions. I call this faux solid. It's like not real proper solid. Um, but I've seen code bases where they used all of these patterns. It's like a UI calling a facade, calling a service, calling a unit of work, calling a repository, calling the ORM, that called the database. Like they did this for every single API call. They implemented all of these. A lot of these would be single line calls to the next, right? That's still layers, right? So that's not proper solid. Now what does proper solid look like? And that is something that I feel that object-oriented developers need to like click somewhere. Um, 
And when it clicks, you finally realize how, um, I love Randall Monroe, by the way, um, the guy that does XKCD. Um, his comics are amazing. There's a relevant one for any situation. Now, at some point, it needs to click. And you need to figure out what Solid is all about. And the thing for me that really helped it click in my head was the realization that interfaces should be owned by the consumer and not by the implementer. So if you treat an interface as an expectation of what this class or implementation is going to do, instead of I already have this thing that already does something and then I'm going to extract an interface and consume that on the other side, not only will you get better in, uh, interfaces and will you get code that is a lot easier to mock, um, you also like make sure that your code is rearrangeable. And that is what Solid is all about. And I think the analogy, and that's where the title of this uh, talk comes from, I have them right here. Um, and if we had more time, I would do an experiment where I get two of you from the audience. Um, and I would tell you to replace blue with green. So if you take this Lego castle and you replace the blue tower with this green tower, um, that would really suck, I can promise you, because I'm an asshole. So what I did is you have to deconstruct the outside towers as well to get the gray walls all the way down to take out the blue, the blue tower. So that's going to take a while. If you have to do that with these marbles, like pour these into a jar, take out the blue ones, pour in the green ones, and you're done. I can promise you marble guy is going to win against um, Lego person, right? So that is what Solid is about. If you have proper abstractions in your code, you can actually replace stuff a lot easier. You, not only can you replace it with a mock for a testing situation a lot easier, it's like if you want to rip something out of your code base and replace it, that's a really good way to do it. And that is what proper Solid actually looks like. And what I see is a lot of developers who don't properly grasp that concept yet, yet they are like taking their code base and complicating their lives by doing 27 microservices for a CRUD application. Anybody working at a, co a company like that? No? Well, kind of. Sorry. <laughs> I feel your pain. Um, so that's what, it, that's what it is. It's like once you understand these things, that what, that's what goes inside of your code base for a certain service. Only then should you be starting to think about how does the whole bigger picture it together. Also, if you're one team doing 27 services, that is not good. I mean, microservices fit for a certain type of scenario. So when you grow up, you can go into like complicating your life further, um, but I think you should go through those steps before that. And I've seen that happen a lot of times, not only in my own career, but in the people that I coach as well. And once that click, you start feeling comfortable about writing object-oriented codes. So when I revisit the problem, um, so microservices, like it, it's a very nice solution to a particular set of problems. This is not my image, by the way. Um, it's from Martin Fowler. Um, it's like you need, you need a certain set of problems that you can solve with microservices, but until you get there, it's only going to get in the way. Life will become harder. It'll be trickier to debug, trickier to deploy, it'll um, make setting up a new developer on your team will make that a lot harder because they need to understand how everything uh, fits together. So I'm, I've always been the kind of person that goes like, I'll, I'll run with a monolith as long as I can until there is pain and then we solve the pain. And maybe separate services are a solution, um, but not not in this case. I mean, we weren't really ready to do microservices. We already had some distribution in our solution, so it was not one monolith. It was a monolith logically, and as a deployment, it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> there was no real need to distribute our solution any further. Um, I mean, load on the platform was something we could cope with uh, without doing microservices. Um, and the piece of code that we were looking at, like this device logic that was living in the back end, that was something that was already living in multiple services. So it didn't really make sense to, um, to do that in that way. Plus, our code base was pretty much this, right? Um, 
we had a not so senior team. Um, some of them were um, remote, like um, from a nearshoring uh, country. I'm not going to name the country, but they were nearshored. And like that already caused some friction in the team as well. So if we would have gone to, to microservices to solve this, that would have made life a living hell. So Martin Feierler said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the first rule of distributed systems is don't distribute. It's like, until you have pain, don't distribute your software, right? I really like Fight Club. It's also one of the movies that I grew up with. Um, but if, if you take anything away from this talk, um, I think you can quote me on this. It's like, never solve a code problem by introducing a deployment problem. It's like, if you have a problem in your code, and you think you can solve it by making it multiple units of deployment, it's just going to be more of a problem, right? Not less. So solve that first. Don't, because if you pull it apart in services, which had already happened before I started at that company, I mean, that piece of code was living in multiple services and was causing a tremendous amount of pain. Um, so I think you'll probably run into the wall a whole lot faster if you think that microservices are gonna solve that problem for you. So the challenges that we had is when we, um, and now let's dive a little bit into the technical side of things. When, when we were thinking about building this, a lot of what we did was .NET based and we were using ASP.NET um, at the time that was MVC 4 or 5 um, as a um, front end to what the UI consumed. Um, and we needed to extend some central API calls. So like there were calls that would allow you to fetch a device list for a certain cu uh, customer. Um, like that sort of stuff needed to know about all the new implementations that we did so that we could get proper derived types. <laughs> um, and we needed to extend logic for some devices. Like some devices behaved a little bit differently. We would have like a, a base uh, thermostat implementation, but then some thermostats did scheduling a little bit differently. So we needed to provide an extension point where we could actually call that uh, extended logic. And then of course, like there was, and that was one of the reasons that it wasn't proper microservices. It all talked to one central database. There were just like different deployment units of code. We needed to be able to migrate our database schema. So that, those were the challenges that we were facing. And when we were thinking, it's like, how are we going to deal with making our device implementations more flexible? That is the stuff that we actually uh, had to struggle with. Now, what happened on that team is um, we decided to use plugins to actually uh, build a proof of concept to see if we could make that more uh, reliable. Um, and we did that, and the POC was successful, and the team started doing this. Now, this is where we're going to get off track of what actually happened in that team. Because as I said, we were using MVC4 on .NET Framework 4.6, 4.7, something along those times. Um, and the tools that we have at our disposal right now with .NET 6 and 7, I mean, that's a whole different story, and a lot of this stuff would become a lot easier if you did it that way. So when I was writing this talk, that was around .NET 2.1 times, um, like .NET Core 2.1. Um, so I figured like, okay, maybe I can like solve all those problems in an easier way if I use the modern stack. And that is the story that uh, the rest of this talk is going to be about. Now I upgraded the solution to .NET 6 yesterday and that was actually not that much work. It took me about half an hour. All of the stuff that I'm gonna show today, it still works in .NET 6, .NET 7 and so on, right? But these patterns, they don't just apply to .NET. They do apply to, to any object-oriented language. You can probably take some of this um, and use the same patterns using Spring Boot in Java or whatever. Um, now, one of the things that people struggle with when they start doing proper solid is um, the architecture around it. So writing solid code is not that hard if you're in a very controlled environment. Um, and it goes really well to write your business logic that way and, and the core of your application. But if you have to write an architecture around it to, to interact with file systems and databases and UIs and so on, like that's when it gets messy. It's like, how do you extract the things from your solid model to the outside. And for me, that really helps if you think about it with Onion architecture. And Onion architecture, not the Onion network, 
Um, the Onion network is amazing. It doesn't have anything to do that, with that. Um, but Onion architecture was a term that was first used by Jeffrey Palermo. Um, and it bears so many similarities with other architecture types that, that have the same values. You might have known it as ports and adapters or hexagon architecture, clean architectures. Like all of these are nuances to very similar ways of doing stuff in code, right? And the focus on, on this um, architecture is really on having as clean dependencies as possible in your uh, solution. So the concept here is you would put your domain model in the center and then write your domain services, which is your business logic around that. And then you would provide application services around that. And that is going to be the interface with the rest of your application. Now, this core should be something that is still relatively reference free. And the cool thing about this is if the um, references only go in, it means you can keep the core of your application completely packaged and reference free. I'll make a couple of exceptions for things like a proper date time library, stuff like that. I mean, that can go into the core, but like things like your DI container and all of that, that should not leak to the inside. That is all infrastructure, it's all integration, and that is stuff that you will actually do implement in that outer layer, um, that outer uh, onion shell as we speak. And that's pretty cool. Once you start, not thinking in layers, but you start thinking like this is the core and even my UI is an integration and my database in an, is an integration, you start thinking it's like I'm not calling upon my database, I'm calling upon an abstraction or, or I'm offering an abstraction to the outside. And that makes this whole architecture a lot easier to implement. And the benefits of that is um, this is like the first architecture that I did in .NET that actually allowed me to replace um, a package or an implementation of some of my dependencies. Because like developers say this all the time, it's like, yeah, 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 we're using uh, an ORM because we're gonna replace our database. They never do because they find out that it's actually not that straightforward to replace a database. Or we might be using a different ORM in the future, so we're gonna put everything in repositories but then they expose iQueryable and they feel like, ah, we cannot really replace that with Dapper. So it's, it's like these this fallacies, but when you use this, your core doesn't know anything about how you handled all that infrastructure stuff. And that will keep alive and all of the tests that you write against that will remain valid even when you replace dependencies. And that is, I think that is the, the powerful thing about all of this. And you can actually take your core and plug it into a completely different um, deployment as well um, and have it function as intended there. Um, because you, you're not depending on which ORM you're using or which UI framework is calling you or whatever, like all of that is not in your core. So if you wanna take this out and use it in a smartphone app, that'll work just fine, right? And that's really cool. And the cool thing about this is this really forces you to write an interface before you call something on the outside. And that is what I just said about solid. It's like writing an interface from a consumer standpoint instead of from an implementer standpoint. That is what matches this really well with solid. Here you're forced to do that with anything that talks to the ex outside. It's like I want to use something from the file system. Okay, what do I, ex what do I expect? I need to get a certain file, okay, good. What are the parameters that I'm gonna use? You write an interface for that and then you implement it, which means that whatever mechanism that you decide to change, like not going to the file system, but to blob storage or whatever, like for the logic of your application, that can remain intact and that's really cool. And for testing, you get a really clear view of which tests go where. If you wanna do unit tests for your core, that works really well because there's almost nothing to mock there, right? Um, and all of your UI and acceptance tests, they will go to the user interface on the outer shell, all your integration tests you can write against your infrastructure layer, and you will basically be able to really easily mock the things that you need to mock in the place where you're actually writing your tests. So I found this to work really well 
when you want to do test-driven development when you for the core, but also when you want to write integration tests for the whole thing. This worked um, very well for us as a team. So let me give you an example. Um, I'm choosing a service locator as an example because we will need it later uh, in this talk. Uh, let's say that you have a need in your domain to locate a certain service um, in, in one of your classes. And this is going to come in handy when we are talking about uh, extension points in our logic for different device types. That's where we're going to need a service uh, a locator. Let's apply the pattern that I just talked about. It's like, okay, we first define what do I need from my DI container to be able to locate a certain service. And that will probably be an interface with just one member, right? One member, that's it. Once we extend it to different things, we can still do that. It's like, okay, one or two members, we're there. And then, of course, we're lazy, right? Good developers are lazy. Who's a lazy developer? I am. If I have to type less, that's always good. So I'll find a package that kind of does what my interface is requesting me to do. And I'll land on Autofac. I've always liked Autofac as, as a DI container in .NET. There's cool ones like .NET service um, collections have come a long way since then. Uh, but OK, let's use Autofac. And then we're going to just implement our one member interface using that package. And then we're at a point where this should be trivial, right? You've all written an interface implementation. But instead of thinking like, what can Autofac do and exposing all of that in a massive service locator DI container contract, we just have this one interface that says, OK, you're going to need to do this. And this implementation will be very easy to do. And the cool thing is, that will live outside of our core. So all our core knows is this contract it's like, if I need a service locator, I can ask it to do that. And all of the rest will be wiring in runtime, right? That makes this um, so easy to do. So when you're happy in the woods with your laptop, there's no power, there's no Wi-Fi. I don't know why this developer is happy. Um, but that is the image that we like to portray. Like, we're happy developers. All of this is going uh, well. And I think that like if you apply solid with, with this Onion architecture in a code base, it really makes some of the stuff that is usually hard a lot less um, frictionful. Right? It's easier to, to write it, to test it, and so on. So let's get back to plugins, because I told you that we had used plugins. And I'm not talking about plugin hybrids. Um, I don't know how it is here, but in Belgium, that's like a fiscal scam. You get like a tax rejection on a hybrid that you never plug in because you fill it up with gas. No? Is that something that they do here? Yeah, I think that's that's like a, a joke. Um, so either full electric or bust. Um, but plugins, as we thought of them, it's like we want to have a an assembly for a certain device type and just be able to deploy that along with our core application. And that would enable the functionality of that device type in our product, like magically, by just dropping in the assembly and restarting the process. Now, <clears throat> if we want to remove that device from what the core was doing at the moment, we would just remove the assembly. And that should not break anything. Now, to be able to do that, that means that your core has to be 100% unaware of which plugins there are. So you cannot tightly couple any plugins to your core. You're going to add them, and in runtime, it should pick up and work work properly. And that's why we made some rules. So also a great movie. Um, to be able to make that work, we would use that onion architecture philosophy. We'd, we would write plugins as something that could reference the core and not the other way around. We had a bunch of conventions that we um, applied. You will see some of them in the code that I'm going to show. Um, and we can just deploy them along, and that would work. And Nothing should break if we remove them. That is a very important um, thing to realize. So enough chit chat. Let's dive into uh, what we needed to do to make this work in um, .NET Core and see what happens. And the example application that is out there on GitHub, you'll get the link at the end, is a to toy collector. We're talking about marbles and Lego today. So let's say that I make 
a generic toy collector application, and we have modules for all the types of toys that we want to collect. We want to collect marbles and Lego sets, so that's the two plugins that we're actually going to write. So these are the six things that I still want to show you um, on the technical side. Um, I will be using .NET for all of these samples, um, but you will see and, and reapply this stuff if you do it in another programming language as well. So dependency injection is going to be um, at the heart of how all of this works. Um, and the process will be a little bit like this. We want to scan which plugins are deployed at the startup and then use reflection on those plugins to figure out uh, which types need to be registered. And I'm, I'm never a fan of auto-wiring stuff, so I wanted to have some type registrar classes inside my plugins that tell the central system like what's in the plugin. Um, and then we should run all of those registrars. Um, now, <coughs> the tricky thing here is, in runtime, this is really easy to do. You scan, you read your, um, you read your directory, your deploy, your plugin directory, or your deployment directory, whatever you want to use, and you scan it for um, all the stuff that's there. Now, in your IDE, this becomes a little bit trickier. Um, because the core doesn't reference the plugins, um, your build dependency tree will fail when you hit run. Because your IDE figures out like which assemblies do I need to build. Okay, this is your startup project. It references the core. Okay, cool. So if something changes in the core, we need to rebuild that. But all of your integrations, like your DI system, it also references the core. So from your startup assembly, you're never going to get to your database layer because that's an outside-in reference. And that is not just for a problem for plugins. It's also a problem for the whole Onion architecture thing. So either you make post-build actions that actually copy stuff um, to the startup assembly path. That's one of the things you can do. Or you can make a development assembly, which you um, exclude from your production build, but that does reference everything. So, so like two approaches you can take there. But the DI container will be acting as if it is just in a deployed scenario, and it'll scan a folder and register all the stuff that's in there. So the way that we do this um, is we scan um, and I just made an abstraction for my um, iService collection in .NET. And what we do in this bit of code is we scan all those um, DLL files and we run the type registers on it. And what we just do is with reflection is we see, is there a class in there that implements my type registrar interface? And I'll just instantiate that um, and run it. Right, so this is something you, it's, uh, you can do both in Java and .NET. Um, but that is the way that we dealt with registering these plugins. So we scan the folder and we run all those type registers. And they just talk to an abstraction of our DI container. So if we want to uh, switch from out of fact to Castle Windsor or whatever that we want to use, um, that should just be this one interface that has the abstraction of our service collection. Now the tricky part for us, um, it's like the best way to get me to do anything is say, Hannes, this is impossible. That's like, that's when I'll get a focused week of works because I'm gonna prove you wrong, right? Um, and the developers on our team, um, as I said, we weren't in the most senior team at the moment. They said, yeah, we can never get ASP.NET to behave the way that we want it to behave by adding controllers from other assemblies and adding views from other assemblies. Um, also, um, so they, they told me that that was impossible. Um, I wrote my own uh, controller selector and view selector in what was at the time, I think, MVC4. Um, it was definitely possible. Um, but there, there are extension points where you can actually extend this, but they made it so much easier in um, .NET Core that I'm gonna show you this code because it's a lot easier to grasp. So if we have all our plugin DLLs, there is a project type in, um, a project type uh, in ASP.NET that is a Razor assembly. 
So it's basically an assembly where you have some controllers and some views, but it's not a proper startup project. So you don't have a startup class or, or wiring everything. It's just a collection of controllers and views. And if you build your project, your plugins like this, it means that all of the stuff that you need is going to be in there. And all you need to do is add them to the application part manager. And that's what you see at the bottom here. It's like the application part manager is something that you get when you uh, do add controllers or add MVC to your um, service collection. You can access the application part managers and uh, application part manager and add additional application assemblies to your ASP.NET application. Like this is out of the box. You don't need any extra dependencies to do this. So like if you start a um, new file, new project, um, ASP.NET Core, like that's going to be in there. And that's, that solves the whole problem. It allows you to add extra controllers, extra views to the ASP.NET runtime. So that already solved one of our problems. It's like we're going to add specific API calls for every device type. It's like, OK, that's handled. But the trickier thing is, it's like we had central API calls that needed to deal with all the different devices. So we needed inheritance to work with data that was coming from the plugins. And the API contracts needed to be able to handle that as well. So that's trickier. And this is one of the days where I really long for the times that we had XML. Because in XML, inheritance is built in. If you have an opening and a closing tag that says Lego set, you know what this is going to need to be deserialized as, right? Well, how do we do that in JSON? Well, right? to curly braces, how do we know what's inside? And if our API takes in a toy and not a Lego set or a marble, it's always going to, by default, get deserialized as toy and only map the properties of toy. So if you extend it with inheritance, like all of that stuff is going to get lost. So that's tricky. Um, there are solutions. There are like easy solutions that you shouldn't use and a little bit harder solutions that are the proper way to do it. So the risky solution, you can set type name handling to auto in Newtonsoft JSON, not in system.text.json, like the new Microsoft one. And there's a big reason why they didn't port it, and it's this. It's like if you do this and you set type name handling to auto, it will allow you to pass dollar $type for anything that needs to be deserialized. And if your deserializer um, realizes that this is indeed a valid subtype of what you're trying to deserialize it, it will map all the properties. Now, the, re the place where this gets really risky is if you take object or dynamic somewhere in your API, that is like a full-blown OWASP vulnerability that will allow them remote uh, code execution because you can like create files on this file system by giving it the right types of objects and so on. So type name handling auto, if you're tempted, steer away from this. OK, there's a better way of doing this. And the better way of doing this, and, and this might, oh, no, that's OK. Um, I was going to say that might be small to read, is to use proper JSON converters. It's like you write a converter that can take um, toys but deserialize them as the correct subtypes. And the amount of code that you need to write for this is not that much. This is one for Newtonsoft JSON, for system text JSON. There is also um, JSON converters. They're, they take a little bit more code than this, but not much. Um, and what you do is you register them at startup to your um, serializer settings. And that will now only work for toys and not for all of the types. So you're safe from this injection attack that can take over. Added benefit is you don't need to use the fully qualified name. You can come up with your own extension method, and that's a lot cleaner for people who are consuming your API, which is always a good thing, right? So that handles polymorphic deserialization, which is the proper term for doing this in API contracts. You might run into this um, another time, so remember that polymorphic deserialization. 
And that enables that in ASP.NET. So that allows us to use Lego sets and toys and get the proper deserialized type when somebody is posting something to our API. And we can add those dollar types in the serialization step as well so that consumers know what they're getting in JSON. And then we're going to need to talk about extending logic. Let's say that we have a bunch of thermostats and one of them has a different um, step that needs to happen when, when we're setting a schedule, that means that we're going to need to have a place where we can actually fire in that logic and call it, but like thermostat behavior is so, something that's going to live in our core, right? We're going to have central thermostat APIs, but we want to extend how that works. And the way that that works is we define a generic interface that works on top of our device type let's say in, in our case, our Lego set or our marble. And, and then we're going to implement that in the plugin. But we need a way to actually call that logic based on what was posted to our API. So we had that polymorphic deserialization going on. We are getting a proper Lego set. We see, OK, this is a Lego set. We need to call Lego set logic. And the thing is, we, and that's why I showed you the service locator uh, earlier, is like this is where a scope service locator comes in handy. Um, when you're doing this kind of extension work with plugins. So we could inject a collection of all the implementing plugins, but what's the fun in that? We can do something more advanced. Now, the tricky thing that we ran into is that the variables that are coming in are still um, boxed as a toy. You do get a proper object that is a Lego set, but it's still a toy. So we're going to need a toy method, but we're going to need to figure out with our marker interface, which is the, the bottom one here, uh, we're going to need to figure out how we are actually, for which generic uh, type that this implementation is valid. So if you implement the bottom interface, we can wire it in our DI container, and we can know that this is the uh, custom logic, the creator logic for um, our thermostat implementation, for instance, or our Lego set. Um, but we do get a generic method, uh, a method that isn't generic that can take a toy and we can throw that object in there. That's the whole idea. So if we do that um, and we use our scoped service locator, and, and you don't need to read through all this code, but what is important is when we are doing this logic and we, we want to make this extension point, what we're injecting is not, um, is not yet the actual implementation of that custom logic, because we will only know the type of what is being passed down in runtime. We will not know it when we actually instantiate the service. And that is a whole tricky thing we needed to work around. So what we built is a wrapper around our DI container that let us reuse the same scope. And since it was a web application, the scope for us was an HTTP request. And we could use that scope to resolve something with a type that we only would know further down. And we would have the resolve generic type uh, interface where we could actually use the type of what was posted to our API to resolve something, then get the custom logic back and run that, right? So that's how we build extension points. When we needed an extension point for, for logic, where we would only know the, know the type of something somewhere far down in the runtime, this is the place where we could do that. And then Entity Framework. It's our um, ORM of choice in uh, .NET. Um, and you can easily as extend that with a whole bunch of types. Um, also, this is where I had a fight with one of our developers. Now, Entity Framework needs to know three things what your code looks like, what your database looks like, and how to map between them, right? It does not need this information at build time. You can feed it all this information at runtime. You can have a DB context without DB sets and feed it all of the info on, on model creating and still have a functional DB context that works. It's not the recommended approach, but it would work. And we had... Um, Hi we had a dependency hierarchy, and in Entity Framework Core, that is solved now. So, so this slide is no longer true. Um, there is more than type per, uh, type per hierarchy inheritance in Entity Framework Core at the moment. Um, but how that works is you dump all the fields for all your inheriting types into a single table, and you have a discriminator column that allows you to check which type is 
this particular record, and then your DB context will uh, handle the rest of that. Now, the problem that we had is, well, we had a central DB context for these central API calls, but it needed to work with the inherited types that we were posting. Otherwise, all that data would get lost when we persisted into the database, right? So we needed to extend that DB context with knowledge that was coming from plugins that were not registered yet when we start up. Now, the way to do that is to inject, um, to have an, an, an um, extend toy context uh, interface where we would actually tell it about like different mappings of the new types that we would actually feed into that DB context. So doing this um, in that implementation is enough and you can use that in the DB context uh, somewhere around the, the fourth line from the bottom. We can actually uh, like register all of these plugins and run this as an extension on our central DB context. And that solved that problem. So now we have a, an API that can do polymorphic deserialization. We can call custom logic in our business logic based on what, what, which types are posted, and we can still use our central DB context to not lose any data when we're saving it, right? We're getting really close here. We're getting really close to making everything work. The last crucial step are database mig migrations. How much time do we still have? About two minutes. About two minutes? Okay. <laughs> And this is, this is going to need to go really quickly, but that's okay. So there's basically two approaches you can take. Either you make a central migration thing um, where you do all the migrations for your central DB context in the DB context assembly. Downside to this is you, you need to load all of your possible plugins so that you get a database table that has all the fields. The problem with that is if you do it in runtime, uh, entity framework does check that there is a migration history table there. If it doesn't match with the model that it has, it just refuses any duty. So in your deployment scenarios, you're going to need to rename that table. So that in runtime, entity framework thinks that the table is not there and that it will just assume that everything is okay. So that's the trick on that side. That's the easy side you've brought, if you've done entity framework. Then there's a distributed approach, and I like that a lot better. Um, Migrations that belong with a certain plugin, like about the fields of that plugin, they should be in the plugin itself. Um, which is cool, but you can never pull that off with, with entity framework migrations. So we looked at a different product called Fluent Migrator. And Fluent Migrator um, just runs all the migrations that it has in order, and you number them. So if you write a migration like that, and that number at, at the top saying uh, is your timestamp, it will run that in order. So that's okay. It doesn't care what the previous migration is, what the next migration is, what the total model is. It does not care, right? But this is really cool. And you can write your migrations in code like this, which resembles EF core migrations a little bit. It's a bit different, but that is something that is easy to maintain. So if you do that, and you can let them live with your plugins, that means that when your application starts, you can just check which migrations have not run. Um, and then run those. Now, I don't prefer that approach. I don't like my database user to have rights to change the schema when it's already deployed. So you can put this in your pipeline, no problem. That does require that when your pipeline runs, it knows which plugins need to be migrated for. But that is like an issue uh, that can be solved. So the result of all of this is a very, very clean, um, a very clean dependency tree. So you have your core of the application in the middle, and that doesn't have any dependencies whatsoever. And the tests, they can just target that. Um, we have our DI container and our web assembly, which is our executing project, like on the left side. And on the right side, we have our database and our migration stuff and all of our plugins. And we get a very nice dependency tree across the whole project. And all of the stuff is easy to add in, easy to remove, easy to replace. So conclusion, um, before anything else, before you start distributing, like structure your code. I mean, learn proper solid, get on board with that. Plugins are really not that hard. You get a lot of tools out of the box in .NET 6. Um, like a lot of this stuff has been done for you. You can look in my implementation on GitHub, like steal that code. I think I put an Apache or an MIT license on it, so you can reuse it, whatever you want. 
Um, don't solve your code problems by introducing deployment problems. Like, take that from me, remember that. And don't worry if you're not at step four or five or eight. I don't know what step eight is. I'm not there. Um, but we all grow, and that is what I realized and what a lot of my job evolves around is helping people grow. It's why I like doing this, for instance. Um, so don't worry. Um, things will click, and it will work. That is the GitHub repo, my Twitter handle, and my ICQ number. I'm on a mission to make ICQ great again. Um, I'm the head of learning and development at Access in Belgium. Um, but yeah, please come find me to chat about this, about guitars, about learning. Um, yeah, like I'll be around. Have a nice rest of your conference.